important. Okay. gentlemen and uh, this is uh, one of a series of interviews that we've done here I haven't done an interview in a very long time so it's my pleasure to be back doing one with one of my uh, earliest influences and one of the guys that kind of got me started and going in the right direction he's done that for a lot of young men and different people and not to date you, <laughs> but Sansone, Johnny Sansone said the same yeah, thing. Johnny told me yeah. some stuff like that the other day. That's right. Very and I think that uh, what it's been about, you know, is that you've been free to give back uh, a lot of the information, not only um, musically, but culturally. You've hired guys that are significant and kept them playing and performing and you know in your blowouts and in your bands and over the years on the road and you know not just African American people but people like Charlie Beatty who were retired you know and, and getting these people out and you know you've you've been a very much a giver to this type of music I like to be a catalyst yeah well it's yeah. great to have you being yeah. a catalyst to some of my YouTube we're good. Yeah. So when I'm sitting here listening to you play, the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, what it was like for me as a kid to hear that sound, you know, the sound of a tongue blocked harmonica with chordal chugging and, and rhythm in between phrases. Right. You know, that sound in person, the first time I remember, you know, for me it was. Madison Slim. Right. You know what I mean? I remember just sitting next to Slim and he, you know, he'd been partying all night. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he was all up. Well, yeah. Partying. <laughs> but he was all up in my face. You know what right. I mean? And that tone. And that tone. And, you know, it's still not lost on me all these years later when I, when I, when I sit in the room with a real master of the instrument. I never, I never take that for granted. When was the first time that you heard that tone? Like, you know, not to insult Bob Dylan or Neil Young, but we, you know, we all kind of came up on that or had heard that first and the harmonic cats for some of us, but that real deep and dark. I, I, yeah. think, I think for me, the first, the first uh, people that really got my attention full blast were, well, first was Sonny Terry. And how but, did you hear him? Well, I heard him on record, and then okay. I saw him live. Okay. And when I saw him live, uh, I didn't think he had, though, the he wasn't an amplified player. Right. And so he didn't quite get me as much as, you know, hearing little Walter play and no. then hearing James Cotton play really And you saw me in. Cotton, of course, numerous yeah. times yeah. in person. You had him on. I got to know him. Right. Yeah. You got to know yeah. him really good. Yeah. Who were some of the first guys that like you actually started to go out and see? 
Well, Cotton was one of the first ones. Sonny was before that. Mm -hmm. uh, in between those guys was Charlie Musselwhite. Musselwhite. And Musselwhite was, you know, he was a big influence too. You know, Did you very beginning. now we on the on the way in here, he saw that I, a student had sent me a George Smith. A, a right. student sent me that. Right. I told him he should have it, and I didn't have it. And right. I told him I said I wish I had that record. And he sent it to me, and I was so yeah. grateful. But yeah. we we there was a George Smith CD in my car. And um, I think, and I discussed with Mark that you may have been the one who turned me on to George Smith. Did you ever see George Smith? I saw him a bunch because he was, yeah, because he was he was in L.A. He was right. really the only Chicago harp player that lived in Los Angeles. How long have you lived in California? My whole life. Your whole I was life. born back east, but I only lived there for six months as a baby. Where back east? Uh, New Haven. In New Haven, Connecticut. Yep. Yep. And my parents moved out to California right after that when I was six months. In what part? Uh, L.A. L.A. Yeah. And George Smith lived in L.A.? He lived in L.A. and he lived in Watts and would play, you know, uh, uh, what would you call it, uh, South, South L.A. or South Central L.A. Okay. That's where he would play. And he also played out at the beach areas, you know, because him and Rod Piazza were a team in the, in the late 60s, early Bacon 70s. Bacon Fat? Yeah, Bacon Fat. That was the name of the band. Yeah. yeah. And then not long after that, you know, Rod kind of went on his way and did his own thing. But, uh, you know, you could see George Smith play, you know, in Southern California at like, uh, you know, Huntington Beach at the Golden Bear or, uh, oh, the Lighthouse in Hermosa Beach, uh, the Ash Grove in Los Angeles. And you did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, he was one of the first old, guys I went to go see how that old were you? actually lived there. I was, you know, probably, you know, between, say, 17 and 22. Jeez, or something that's like that. awesome. When did you start playing? I started playing when I was 15, I think. Okay, that was the same age as me. Yeah. 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 I was, like, right around there, 14, yeah. 15 or so. Yeah. yeah, I met you a few years after that. So, I think, I mean, I started in, like, 71, I think, and... And started going to shows probably about seventy two, right in the Bay Area. Okay. I mean in, in L A. In L A. So, <clears throat> the, like I said, the first guy I saw was Sonny Terry and Brown and McGee. Saw those two guys, and and Sonny was blowing acoustic harp. Mm -hmm. But you know, I mean, he would play almost right on the mic. You know, and you mm -hmm. hear him do like he could do one of those really badass, you know, tongue warble things. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And it almost sounded like a guy doing a head shake the way yeah. he played it. Yeah, but. You know, like watching him live, it was like that really got my attention. And then, uh, and then Charlie Musselwhite at the same club a, a couple months later, the Ash Grove in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. And then uh, maybe you know a month or two after that, I saw James Cotton. I mean, I may have the order reversed. Right, it, right. It's it, very yeah. possible I yeah. saw Cotton and then Charlie. I yeah. can't remember. You can't remember. But I remember I would I would play like you know. Um, records at home all the time and my mother really liked Cristo Redemptor by Charlie Muscle. It's a pretty song. And she, yeah. she loved it. She loved the slow song. Right. She didn't like the fast one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She loved the slow one. So she became a big Charlie Muscle. Like so going into this thing, how much did you actually know? I mean, these are the kind of questions that I think some of my fan base is interested in. Like, did you know about first, second, and third position? If not, where'd you learn this? You know, I mean, was it from I, a I really, book? Where do you get? Where who, well, did George Smith teach you third position? Where'd no, you, what happened was I had that book by Tony Glover called yeah. Blues Harp. Yeah, yeah. And it was just a ball of confusion. R really? Yeah. I mean, the book was so confusing. It was like yeah. you know, he'd say, <laughs> "Little Walter, sad hours, either B flat harmonica and F or a chromatic." Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's like, which how can you play chromatic <laughs> on yeah. that song? Yeah, I know. You know, I, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. And so you know, it had all this in misinformation. That was just <laughs> Not unlike the confused. internet today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was just confused after reading that book, but it did turn me on to a lot of people. Yeah. Because it had this yeah. beautiful shot of like James Cotton in there. And, yeah, yeah. You know, so you're like, I got to get those yeah, records. Sunny Boy, get, yeah, Sunny Boy 1, Sunny Boy 2, yeah. Jimmy Reed, you yeah. know, all these guys. Yeah. So I kind of got hip to everybody through that book. Yeah, yeah. But I also had lessons. I mean, I had like a guy named Bill Lupkin that was from Indiana. Sure, yeah, yeah. Bill, Bill Lupkin, actually gave great me a player, lesson. great player. He gave me a lesson back. Still in, around, yeah. yeah, yeah. He gave me a lesson when I was about 17 years old. I'd been playing for maybe three years, two or three years, and uh, he had a, a little 
flyer at a, at a music store. It said Chicago Blues Harmonica lessons. You know, <laughs> played with Jimmy Rogers. I was like, damn. Yeah, yeah. You know, I better call this guy. Yeah. So I took down one of those, and you know, I called him up, and and I was trying to learn the Creeper at the time mm -hmm. by James Cotton. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's got. I mean, the Creeper's got this one part in it where you know it goes, you know, it goes like. I was doing it like this. I'd be going. <laughs> lip pursing <laughs> it. Lip pursing it. Right. And it sounded like shit. And I was like, you know, what's the deal with this? Yeah, at least so you I could went, hear that. So I went yeah. to I went to Bill, and Bill goes, no, he's tongue blocking all of that. And you're like, and what's he's bending. So you were like, what's that? Yeah. I yeah. Was like, well, I knew what tongue blocking was, because I was already tongue blocking, but I'd only tongue block like two, three, and four. Okay. And then I'd start lipping everything after that. And then if I went to a bend, I would just lip purse the bend. Right. So right. I would only tongue block when it came to like, you know, I'd, I'd learn to like tongue block because I heard Big Walters. So right. I'd go like. But no, but you were lip pursing that bend? I lip pursed, I'd lip purse this part. Right. And the, Yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that's how I was playing. Right. So I didn't, never bent when I tongue blocked. One of the things I like about you um, as a teacher and uh, as, a, as a, a player is you, you, you believe that there is, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, mean, I know you're primarily a tongue blocker. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably, but it's fair to say 90%? Yeah, yeah. Something like that. But you, you do recognize that there are certain techniques that lip pursing is good oh for. yeah yeah okay yeah. okay right I, I think a lot of people were surprised in the the uh dave barrett interview with kim when he said that he'd only been tongue block bending a few years or something yeah you know well, i remember that because i remember asking him when i first it, met him yeah 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 i was like don't you tongue block he goes hardly at all yeah right i was like wow sure sounds like tongue -block. right it sure sounds like yeah. it yeah so it's interesting, you know, that there's more than one way to skin a cat. Yeah. However, there is... Charlie's like that, too. Charlie don't right. tongue block that much. He plays the way I was just showing. Now, that's all well and good, and, and it is cool, uh, but there is something about that embouchure that lends itself to rhythm yeah. ideas. Like, yeah. ideas. Like, it teaches you on its own. Is it fair to say... Uh, well, I mean, the way I look at it, the thing that tongue blocking really does is, is it gives you this, uh, yes, it's a rhythmic thing that it gives you, you know, the fact you're going. You know. Right. And, and there's a flow that you get with tongue blocking that. It's fairly easy to do. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. It, it, there's t after you learn it, it, it becomes easier in many ways than the yeah. uh, the other. I remember it was such a monster to learn. Though. It, it really was hard for it me. Was like, it was like a handicap for me. Well, I mean, for about three months. I've been doing these YouTube videos now for oh, like something like fifteen years, right? Uh -huh. That's how long I've been doing these. And when I first started out, I was a complete lip purser, and right. and now. You know, 15 years later, I, I tongue block a lot. Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, that I've, I've noticed about it is, or that I tell people is, you know, I don't think that the good tone is exclusive to tongue blocking. No. However, I feel the embouchure lends itself to good tone. It and does. Because yeah. the more of the harmonica that you can get in your mouth and the lower your jaw is, the better your tone's going to be. Whereas when you lip pursing, I feel like it lends itself to bad tone. Like it, it, yeah. it, it can become easy to, to, yeah. to kind of back off the thing. And, and the other thing is that maybe not even just good tone, but there's a certain sound that comes with tongue blocking, you, you know, that just on that three draw, you can hear that, that there's certain sound that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with tone. I, I mean, in many ways it's almost thinner, but it, it, it I think a lot of what happens is just like the way you described it is that it's all because everything's right in here, you know, you get a certain there's a certain kind of resonance that happens just right here. 
let alone putting the harmonica up there. I mean, you definitely have your own tone. That's what everybody says, and I don't even know what the hell it is. And you have your own style. You have a very bouncy, swingy, West Coast sound, you know, naturally. I mean, I guess yeah. from coming from there. Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> the way that George Smith and those guys were for you is how you were for me. I mean, I met mm -hmm. you when I was 18 years old out, in a, out of a bar outside right. of Idaho. Right. And, I mean, Boise, I yeah. already had your records. You know what I mean? I, I was already listening to you play yeah. and uh, I was really blown away by your control over the three draw bend and all of this kind of <laughs> and all that right. the, all the the coming underneath yeah. a half step right. underneath that that's a lot of what I try to teach my students yeah. today I teach that too big time <clears throat> and and you do yeah. teach and Mark does teach and does do Skype lessons yeah. how do people get in touch with you if they want to take a Skype lesson Facebook Messenger Fa you're big Skype. on Messenger yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. however you want yeah. okay okay yeah. cool and just for the record while we're plugging stuff what's your website markhummel.com easy enough Okay. Very easy. And you tour constantly. Still. Well, I don't I don't like you do. I don't I mean, do I don't, honest, do I don't do that. To be honest with you, yeah. I don't you know, I look at some people's schedules now like yours or Aki's or Nick Moss and yeah. and Rick Estrin's and actually Rick's slowed down I think some, but you yeah. know, I mean all you guys are playing like festivals and stuff like that. I wish I was playing more festivals. I think you I know. got like three this year, man. Don't well, they, they yeah. were the same. We're in the same uh, okay. boat. Yeah, but yeah. you know, I mean, the, the 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 bottom line is, you know, I used to be out so much that in a way, I really backed off last year on purpose. I didn't. It wasn't by accident. I, I remember you saying yeah. that you were going to do that, accident. and that's when you kind of started digging into the teaching and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, I started teaching more and and. Uh, and pretty much just decided that I didn't want to just live on the road like, you know, six months on the road or whatever per year. What is you know. what has it been like, man? Uh, you know, I mean, I remember when, when I wrote a whole article called "Stay in College," right? right. Which was is a quote from you. Is it? It's what you told me. Have you ever read it? Have you ever read it? No, but you I should read it. You. you should read it. It's yeah, great. It's, it's called. It. It's a proactive guide to mid-level success in the music That's industry. Good. Yes. And it's called Stay in College, uh, and and uh, and it starts with I once asked harmonica great Mark Hummel. That's great. That's how it starts. Yeah. That's how it starts. Yeah. Uh, how do I, how do I get to where you are? That's what I asked. I was 18 years old. I and said you, stay in you college. You said stay in college. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good it's, advice. It was still really holds good true. advice. Really good still advice. Still right? true. If you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it. And, not, and, and, and if somebody tells you to do it, that's just really reckless of a thing to do because yeah. it's a tough life. It's a really tough life. I mean, what I would say is, I mean, I see like yourself or Aki Kumar or, you know, some of the younger musicians, uh, Dennis Grunling. And, and, and I have to say, I mean, I see you guys following in my footsteps. I told Dennis that a couple of years ago. I go... I go, damn, man, you're doing what I used to do out there. You know, you're you're just out there all the time, every mm -hmm. night. You know, it's and it's it's grueling for me to even look at people's schedules yeah. when it's like that. Yeah. It, it's hard for me to look at a schedule and go, God, I remember what that's like. Did you do time in and notice in my choice of words <laughs> in other people's bands prior to starting your own? Very little. Very little. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I worked with... Uh, Sonny Lane Slim? No. I, I worked so. with a guy named Sonny Lane. Oh, Sonny Lane. Sonny Lane. Lane. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people thought that. I'd say Sonny Lane, and they'd think I was talking about Sonny Lane. Yeah, that's what uh, I thought. Sonny yeah. Lane was a guitar player that I played in uh, Mississippi Johnny Waters and Sonny Lane. Well, I'm glad and, we did this myself. interview. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. And we, we had a band called The Blues Survivors, you know, from 1977 through 81. And uh, and I uh, played with those guys, but it was pretty much you know me doing a lot of the business, even back then. Even back then. Yeah. So I mean, the guys I played with before that, there was a guy named Cool Papa I played with, who guitar was guitar player, a guitar player from Colorado mm -hmm. originally, and then uh, I played with him for about maybe a month or two, and then a guy named Boogie Jake, who Reggie Scanlon and I both mm -hmm. played with Boogie Jake. Okay. A guy named Eddie Ray on guitar. Uh, we played with him for and about a year. And you got vans and drove around and stuff like that? No, this was all just local, all just local. Northern California stuff. 
And then uh, Mississippi Johnny Waters and the Blues Survivors, which was pretty much all of our, you know, me and Johnny's band. And, you know, I mean, we worked all the time, but it was all very vocal. And that's and so California, tell, California tends to be that way. You guys was, go up and down the state a lot. Yeah, but it was 84 that I really started traveling. How did that come about? It was sort of a, a combination of things. I went to Salt Lake City in 1982 or 80, yes, about 1982. I went to Salt Lake and I did a, a gig at a club called The Zephyr there. Yeah, I remember The Zephyr. It yeah. became the goat after and they, that. No, that was two different clubs. Oh, two different clubs. Two different clubs. Okay. But The Zephyr was a nice big room uh, and we played a four-nighter there. And, and, and it sold out like all four nights. It was, this was about a 250-seat club. So, I mean, that was pretty good to sell out four nights there. That's a thousand people. Yeah. You know, and at the end of the gig, the guy goes, man, you guys ought to, you guys ought to travel. There's a lot of gigs around, you know, the West. Mm -hmm. you know? And I said, well, you know, how do I do that? And he goes, I'll give you a big long list of names. Just send them your stuff. And, and that's what you did. That's exactly what I did. The, the farm, guy, yeah. the guy gave me like 20 clubs and I just called them all up and Set up my little cassettes, and, and then just know. sort of started expanding. I expanded and, and until you were yeah. until you were east of the first. It was the west, then it became the Midwest, then mm -hmm. it became the South, and then it became the East Coast. Okay, so that's how I did it. And that's I did interesting. It with cassette tapes originally, then I put out an LP in 1985. And, and what was that? What was that, that called? Called Playing in Your Town. Ah, I yeah. think I've heard about that disc, but I don't think I've. I've ever heard. I was in 85 on my old label, Rockinitis Records. I think that some of the, your early records are some of the most valuable blues records there are because there were so few printed. <laughs> They're worth $3 now. No, I think that there's so few printed on vinyl. That there may be a few in there like that. I haven't found them yet. <clears throat> Did you know this guy named Hank from, from Birmingham? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So he's, Hank Moore, yeah. Right, right. So Hank's one of... From Birmingham. One of Hank's prized possessions is an early Mark Hummel right. vinyl. I've seen yeah. all the vinyl yeah. he's got. He's got everything I ever put He had on. to reinforce his floorboards to keep the... I believe from, it. That guy bought the, everything from yeah. everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really cool he guy. He's a real big-time yeah. collector. I haven't heard from him in a while. He's, he's still on okay. Facebook. Okay, okay. Yeah. I have to look him up. He's on Facebook. I have to look him up. Yeah. All right, let me think. Okay, so after all these years on the road and stuff and... Um, we won't get into the details of it, but you eventually decided you, you had to you had to clean up your act there, the drinking and the drugs. I mean, well, my, I, I, my channel's very open. Yeah, right? I like mean, my people know that I have bipolar disorder. They know that they know that I've suffered with addiction. That I've been yeah. on and off the wagon for years. You know, I've never talked about how right. I got off the wagon. Right. right, you know, but they know that. Well. Just for the record, I, I actually gave up drugs and alcohol in 1984, and I didn't start going on the road until the following year. You, really so you heavily. took some time to... I was smart enough to figure out that if I was doing drugs and alcohol, I couldn't do the road life. Right. And so I didn't even start to try to go on the road until... I think I'd done that Salt Lake City trip, and I was like out of my mind in 1982 mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tried to do that, and I realized I couldn't do both. And you've probably seen a number of musicians. I mean, I go down that road, and um, and some of them not make it. Yeah, most of them crashed and burned and died. And, yeah, yeah, or yeah. went to I mean, jail or prison. Of the original blues survivors, which was five of us, four of the guys, no, three of the guys are gone. Right. Yeah, out of five. <clears throat> On the subject of, of that, uh, you saw. I'm sure you got a chance to see, and I know you've met. Paul Butterfield. Yeah. 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 We did two, I did two shows opening for him. What was it like at that time period to be a young musician when Butter was in his heyday? Um, what did you guys look up to him the same way that like guys like me oh, looked yeah. up to Kim and Hell stuff yeah. like that? Oh, yeah. yeah. You guys did. Oh, I looked up to him big time. Yeah. Kim looked up to him. He wasn't a traditional yeah. harmonica player. Yeah, but he was, um, you know, the best way to describe Butterfield is he, that he was kind of like the guy that was the model, you know. What do you mean? Tell me more. He was kind of the model, you know, white blues guy that came out of Chicago and mm -hmm. played with, you know, all the, the older yeah. black guys. Yeah. And, and made records and, and, and went, on, went on the road and started, you know, really gaining a following. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, he was big. And, I mean, and he was great, really big at the and time. And a great vocalist, too. Yeah, he was and, a great singer. Yeah. So speaking of that subject, when did you start singing? And I started singing about the same time I started playing, but I don't think I put the effort I did into singing that I did playing. No, I know I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, part of it was that, you know, I mean, I was I was performing with, you know, some, some guys like Johnny Waters that have this incredible voice. Right. And it was kind of right. like there was no way I could hold the candle to what Johnny was doing. Right. You know, so I, I mean, I sang, but I didn't, mm -hmm. I would just basically open the show. I think there's some yeah. songs that your voice really lends itself yeah, to. Yeah, it's and sort of really knowing how to great. choose, knowing how to choose your material. I think you've after. chosen some exceptional material over the years. Um, there's some really weird songs and some great stuff that you've done. One of my favorites, and I've, I've mentioned this to you before, was uh, Radiates That Charm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What record was that off of? That's Mary Arthur Lee? Alexander that did that. It's okay. off Hard Love and 90s. Hard Love and 90s. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, I, I had that record, and I, I loved that. And I got I did have the pleasure of getting to see you play that live a couple of times. Huh. And I thought you always sang the hell out of that oh, one. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. There was another one I did by him on the very first album called Sally Sue Brown. Oh, I, I got to check that out. Which was 1985. So I've been into his music since the early 80s. Do you know offhand how many records you have out? At least 25 to 30. 25 to 30 records. Yeah, I mean, of... You know, both projects of my own and and, and, and conglomeration things like you know the blowouts or right. How many of that? How many of those do you think are still available to the to the average? Uh, I purchaser? would think you could find almost all, except for maybe uh, the one that's probably hard to find is uh, nail peas are obviously hard to find. Um, hard love and nineties is a little bit hard to find. Mm -hmm. the, the the CD that was from nineteen ninety, mm -hmm. but I think everything else I've seen still on. Mm -hmm. on Amazon or whatever you can find used copies. You started recording on labels pretty early. Not really. I always felt like I was putting out my own stuff. Uh, I mean, yeah. well, let's see. Let's go back to like when I first got into you. I think, what were you on? Flying Fish or Rounder? That or was, or Flying Fish was like 1991 or something. Right, that's right. Was like but I was on a label called Double Trouble in 87. Okay, so back to 87. Yeah. So that was out of Holland. What would you? What would your advice be to the young artist that's trying to get on a label now? Well, I mean, my advice is why bother? Right. Because you you, you kind of really don't get a lot out of a label anymore. I mean, I'm on a label still. I'm on Electrify, which I've been with since like since uh, 2000. Long time, yeah. 2000. But the main reason I'm on it is because I really really like the owner of it, Andrew mm -hmm. Galloway. And I feel like what he's trying to do is really important because he's really trying to promote the kind of music I love, you know, which is traditional traditional blues, blues. Yeah. yeah, and jazz too. They do some not other, really jazz. I thought Electrify did do some jazz. No, he does no. more kind of you know folky type blues. Like, Who are some of your label mates? Well, I mean, Billy Boy's been on there a long time. All right. Um, Mel Brown was on All there. All right. Yeah. Uh, Snooky Pryor did okay. four records with him. And, uh, Willie Big Eyes Smith. Yeah. Um, there's a, another guy that's really great up in Toronto, and I'm blanking on his name right now. But yeah, he's got a bunch of great, a bunch of great talent on that. Uh, James Harmon's done. <coughs> Harmon. Two that's or three right. records on there. That's right. Paul Osher. Osher's on there too. Yeah, okay. Quite a few. Well, yeah, that's harmonica, great. A lot of harmonica players on his label. Uh, what do you think? Uh, made you come up with the idea of the blow-off and the, the blow -off, the blow -off was really kind of a for uh, people who don't know just really quickly yeah. what is it what is a harmonica blow -off? well the harmonica blow was something i've been doing since 1991 and it was it was I really no idea you've been yeah. doing it that long yeah i started in 91 and i did consecutively through you know this year it'll be the 30th 30th anniversary in 2021 Okay, wow, that'll so, be a, yeah. that'll be a big year. Yeah, but I mean, naturally, I'll be on the anniversary. Of course, I'm sure, of yeah. course. Jason. I mean, I've got a lot of great people on it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So, I mean, like, it's really amazing all the people I've. Who were some of the earliest cats? Well, the earliest one was Rick Estrin. Rick Estrin. Dave Earl. Uh huh. Uh, a guy named Doug J from the East Coast. New names. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it was a pretty. It was a much smaller event back then. Keep going, keep going. Uh, and then I had uh, oh Linwood Slim, Linwood Slim, Al Blake, Al uh, Blake, um, Gary Smith, uh, 
William Clark. Uh, Bill Norton, Clark. Norton Buffalo. Those were some of the earlier ones. We have another uh, show on this channel called Blues Stories. You ever seen it? Uh -uh. It's great. Uh, I, I, I get different artists. To, it was a big decision today whether we were going to do an interview or whether we were going to have you tell a blues story. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but I haven't done an interview in a really long time. Yeah. And uh, so, but blues stories is stories about, and you know, Nick Moss did one on Willie Big Eye Smith. Right. I, have, I have one on Nick Curran and one on Pat Ramsey up right. there. Yeah. All right. So, so who is, keep, keep going with this names of, of people on these, on this. I'm well, sure you have so many stories. Yeah. I mean, and boy, would I love to hear something about William Clark you I know, mean, later. Paul yeah. DeLay was on the early ones. Wow. Johnny Dyer. Johnny Dyer. See, now, um, you turned me on yeah. to Johnny Dyer. Yeah. Yeah, I had never heard of Johnny Dyer. Yeah. And Johnny was an L.A. guy. He was one of George Smith's protégés. And he was really great. He traditional really great. Of player. Yeah. Really great and a great singer. Yeah, yeah. Just was, a great singer. Yeah, I mean, we did an album called... Uh, Rolling Fork Revisited that was like a Muddy Waters tribute. Okay. And it's probably the closest thing you're going to hear to a modern album of Muddy Waters songs that really sounds, that sounds like, like that. that. Yeah, you know? Great. And I mean, it had, you know, Paul Osher and Francis Clay and yeah. Rusty Zinn, Bob Welsh. I mean, as much as I... Great players. As much as I love Little Walter's solo playing, my favorite is when he's behind right. Muddy and Jimmy Rogers. Yeah. You know what I mean? I it's, agree. Yeah. It's, and that, that was what, that's what got me to really want to do that project. And it was really Johnny pulling me aside and going, Mark, we really got to do a record, man. <laughs> I'll say Muddy and you play Little Walter. That's what's up, and man. So, That's know, what's so he's up. like, man, we got to do this record. That's and he kept up. on me about it. And finally man, I got to hear together. this record. Oh, I'll I give you a copy of it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me think. But it, it came out in 2004. And I was kind of bummed because it never really got the kind of notoriety. I mean, I think, I think it made like number three in the Living Blues charts. That's it's about not as, bad. Which is not bad, but I yeah. mean, you know, to me it should have yeah, it was, really opened some doors, you know, BMA-wise and things like that. It didn't get any attention. Well, back then it was the Handy Awards, right? right? I guess yeah, you're right. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. Which, by the way, you're a multiple award winner, BMA or Handy Award well, Double. Winner. I've won so two. That's multiple. Yeah, that's is it? I guess it is. Right. Okay, you I guess you're multiple, right. Yeah. yeah, multiple. All yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, what do you think? Uh, Multiple mark. Yeah, and so, so uh, naturally you know it's a life-changing event. Your whole life is, it is. I nothing's mean, things, the same. It really opened conference. the door when, when I got those awards. <laughs> Not one blues festival out of it. <laughs> like, I feel you, bro. I feel you. I got two myself. You know, one I gave to my mom. Yeah, yeah. yeah I gave one to kid. <laughs> to kid, yeah. yeah. Um, what's, what's the future look like, man, for, for Mark? I mean, you know. You know, I mean... My, my attitude is I'm really trying to just uh, uh, always do something different when I do a record. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, my last one was an instrumental album of harmonica stuff. Mm -hmm. And I really tried to do a, a, a wide kind of variety of, of pieces in there. Everything from traditional blues to jazz to... You know, acoustic. Yeah, it's one of the things I loved about you. And over really the years. tried to yeah. make it different every time. So my newest one's going to be more of a pre war. Really? Blues thing, yeah. Holy I'll play cats. Some, I'll a lot play of acoustic stuff. stuff and it's all acoustic Some solo much. harmonica stuff? Uh -huh. I, I didn't really do any solo pieces, but I did do, I mean, it's almost all things I did with this group I work with called the Deep Basement Shakers. Yeah. Which was a keyboard guy. I think I've I heard have, of those. There's two on yeah. that record, on the new album. Okay. With those guys. Okay. Billy Flynn on guitar yeah. and a rub board player. Yeah. And then a, he plays like a suitcase kick drum. That would go over great here. It would. It yeah. would go over you great. You to bring that outfit down here. I mean, it's the kind of thing that would go over on all kinds of festivals yeah. and in all kinds of situations, but it's been a real struggle kind of getting it out there. Yeah, right. You know, because it's, yeah. it's almost more retro. I'm going back further and further, and it's kind of like, you know, People are about screaming guitar seats. Boy, guys. are they. You yeah. know, and you try to book a group without a guitar player, yeah. it's not easy. Yeah, right, you know? right. So, I mean, I have Billy on the album. <clears throat> I have Billy Flynn on the album, who is awesome. Yeah. But uh, it's not really a, there's no, it's not, no screaming guitar solos on this new record. 
You got to tell me a William Clark. Yeah. A William Clark story. A William Clark story. You well, got I, mean, I, I mean, I'm a I huge knew, fan, bro. I knew I mean, William. I knew you know, William. I never got to see him. I always called him I Bill. Never got, I never called him William. Tell so. me a Bill story. I never got to <clears> see. I never got to see Bill Clark. Well, I mean, he was he was one of those guys that I met him uh, in Los Angeles, probably around the same time I was seeing George Smith, because he was kind of one of George's understudies. Right. And uh, I would go see him at a club. There was a little club on the Hermosa, was it Redondo Beach Pier? Um, and I can't remember the name of it because I'm so brain dead these days with mm -hmm. names, but mm -hmm. uh, it was a club he would play all the time in the Redondo Beach Pier. And uh, so, you know, he would, He'd, he'd be playing and you know I he'd usually invite me or Linwood Slim or whoever was in the audience to sit in mm -hmm. I remember one time mm -hmm. uh, one time he came down to a gig I was doing at the lighthouse in uh, Redondo in Hermosa Beach and he's sitting in the back of the club and sitting back there you know great big imposing guy yeah you know? it really was so so I go up to him on the break I go how you doing Bill and he goes yeah I'm all right they could take you and Norton Buffalo and all you guys and throw you out that pier out there. That'd be all right with me. <laughs> <laughs> and he just, I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> oh, man. Norton was cool. Norton was cool. Norton was a good friend of mine, too. I didn't know that you guys yeah. were tight. Yeah. 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 I was really good friends with Norton. Yeah. It, and Clark, I mean, me and Clark were friends from the very beginning. You guys were too. buds. Yeah. yeah. I used to go to his house and stuff. We'd sit around and drink <laughs> beer. and Curtis Salgado. Curtis is another one I've known forever. Forever. Yeah, yeah. Right. And of course you knew, did you know Pat Ramsey? You know, I didn't know Pat really well, but I met him when I went to Florida. I think Pat was a fan of yours. Could be. You know what I mean? He, Could be. He liked a lot of traditional harmonica players, even yeah. though he wasn't a traditional harmonica player. Yeah. He was know? a nice guy, man. He was a he was a real kind of one of those blue-eyed soul singer guys. Man, Pat could you really know? sing. He could he really could sing. Really, really yeah. sing. We keep yeah. looking up here because there's a picture of Pat up here that stays up there. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I've kind of, you know, I kind of got to know all the harp players out the giddy. I think you for know? me, um, the most wonderful thing about being involved in this music has been that. Has been getting to know you guys, getting to be able to sit down, have conversations, mm -hmm. hang out. Um, you know, getting, you know, for me, one of the, the, the greatest times I ever had in my life was touring with your blowout. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, just getting to tour with my, yeah. you know, getting in the van with that's Charlie Beatty. That's what makes those tours and, great. And man. Anson, it's, just like getting in the van with those That's guys. the incredible thing about the blowouts is yeah. that it's really, a, it's, it's an opportunity for all these musicians that normally wouldn't be together to play together and sit in a van together and, and eat, eat breakfast or lunch right. or dinner together and it's just it's a great hang and the real yeah. reward of this music is is really a cultural thing it, it's yeah. more than it is I mean yeah. it's certainly not the money you yeah. Know, yeah it's not about the money it's it's about it's really about uh, for the blowouts in in my eyes what makes them so special is that especially when you span generations and you, you talk Snooky about Pryor, yeah, Lazy you get guys Lester, like Snooky or right. Lazy Lester, or Billy Boy Arnold or, or uh, uh, Willie Big Eye Smith or, or Sam Myers, you know, mm -hmm. all Carrie Bell, mm -hmm. all these guys. You got Billy on, Branch. Billy Branch has been on a ton of these. He's a, yeah. He's a fiery player. Yeah. Billy's yeah. still a very fiery. He's a, he's a troublemaker, but yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. a fiery <laughs> That's why I, that's why him and I get along so good. You know? Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Sometimes we get along good. Sometimes we don't. I bet. Yeah. But anyway, he's but great. He, we're he's both great. hotheads. That's yeah. All. Yeah. He's great. He's a great player. Uh, he's a great player. And you mentioned Carrie Bell. Carrie. Too. I yeah. mean, Carrie was really one of was the idol for for Billy. Right. Like, right. Well, nobody. Big Walter and you know, guys no, like that. Cotton. Nobody imitates Carrie except for Billy. And when you get to hear, right. you know, when you get to hear somebody yeah. imitating. Carrie yeah. Bell, it's very cool. Yeah, he it's, definitely yeah, I does miss that. that. I miss that. I, I should yeah. learn to do a good Carrie Bell just to just to carry that sound on. Yeah. You know what I mean? I miss yeah. I miss him a lot. There's a lot of great stuff about just the blowouts have been really a a, a ball. They're really exciting. When, yeah. When's the next one? And who do you got on it? Three weeks. Three weeks. Who's yeah. on it? Or two weeks? I got uh, Curtis Salgado, 
Curtis. I got uh, John Nemeth. Oh, we love John. I got yeah. Aki Kumar. We love, we're big Aki fans. Yeah, yeah we're big Aki I got, fans. I got uh, Anson in the band. Okay, great. And then I got this guy named Andrew Ali, who's out of Richmond, Virginia. That's sure. Awesome. Super. Awesome Super player. player. Super player. I'm totally yeah. aware of him. Yeah. Super nice guy. Yeah, traditional yeah. Um, blues guy. So we're only doing three blowouts on this next tour because I did the January ones. This was just one I just added on. I kind of I kind of got inspired to do it because Andrew I saw some clips of Andrew on on YouTube and I went man this Andrew sounds just awesome he goes I'd love to do a blog and I said well let me try to put something together so dude kinda, the fact that you brought him like you know like you know Andrew if you're watching I'm sorry if this is insulting but but there is there is you know he's not a well known player. Yeah, it doesn't and, and, matter though. He's got something special. That's what I'm. That's see. That's right. what I'm talking about. About you giving back, yeah. and that you've done that consistently over the years. Is you've booked people. I try to do that to yeah. expose people yeah. to. I kind of did it with Johnny this year. You know, I had Johnny on the blowouts in January. Johnny. Johnny Sandstrom. Oh, okay, right. In, in January, and it was like you know, I mean, part of that was you know, I'd known Johnny a long time, uh, and we did a we did a 2011. Blow out down south with him and Fingers Taylor, mm -hmm. and that was with uh, Josh Falero and R.W. and Wes Star. That's yeah. well, that's mostly your band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Uh, and uh, and that was the last time I'd had him, so I kind of hadn't had him in for a long time, and I'd never had him on the West Coast, so I wanted to bring him out and have him, you know, be part of the show, and it was amazing. Yeah, Sandstorm's so, a great player. Yeah, it was really it was great. Johnny and, and and Bobby Rush and. Right, uh, uh, James Harmon, Kenny Neal, right, right, and Anson in the band. You guys looked like you had a ton of fun on that tour. We had a ball. I followed it on Facebook. Yeah, it, it was fantastic. really, really fun. Well, I don't know what else to say, Mark. Uh, that's we're a little past the thirty-minute mark, so here, so that's probably All right, man. way past the viewers' attention well, thank span. Thank you so much, Jason, thank for you, having me, man. man. Thank you very, very much. For I being appreciate there. it. www.markhummel.com. Follow him on Facebook. Check him out. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them in there. Mark, I'm sure we'll check back and on let, the video. And let the viewers know that we have a, a, a Facebook Blues Harmonica blog page, ah. a Facebook Mark Hummel and the Deep Basement Shakers page. Go ahead and like them. Join them. And a Golden State Lone Star Blues Review uh, page, a Mark Hummel and the Blues Survivors page. All those are Facebook pages because some people don't like my politics. Ah, yeah, I stay out of that. Um, Buy Mark CDs, I did. That's partially how I learned how to play and I'm here for you guys today. I appreciate you all watching. Thank you very much. Visit my website, www.mooncat.org. I had a great time interviewing one of my heroes today. Thank you so much. Love you. Love Thank you, you Jason. You're tremendous. You're a all tremendous right. player, a great person, everything. So are you. The whole package. So are you. Thanks, man. buddy. Thank okay. you. Okay.